computer person has told me that that's happening. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening to the official Radix Media Brooklyn Book Festival book and event, New Voices of Arab American Literature. My name is Meher Manda, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm here to represent Radix Media, one of my coworkers. Nick Hurd is also here. Nick, say hello. Uh, is also here representing Radix Media. So a little quickie information on what we're all about. We are Radix Media, we're a worker-owned union printer and independent publisher. Uh, based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and yes, uh, we were also flooded a little bit, but, uh, uh, you know, thankfully we avoided any serious damages. So that is that is good. But um, we've been um, in New York for about a decade. We've been printing for about a decade and we've been independent publishers for a little over five years. So we are a baby young publisher in that sense. Uh, but in those five years, we've had the immense privilege to publish um, an exceptional code of writers um, across styles, across forms. Um, our intention is always to champion, uh, you know, voices from underrepresented communities, experimental writing, audacious risks uh, in literature, um, and we are not tied to any specific genre or form. So we've had the privilege to publish poetry, to publish publish fiction, nonfiction, comics, graphic arts, zines you name it, and we've had a chance to dip into it. Um, and that's been the fun part of being a young publisher finding their roots. Uh, we've been very honored that our titles have received acclaim from Penn Awards, from Eric Hoffa Awards, from the Forward Reviews, just across the spectrum. Um, and we're very much supported by the community of independent publishers, not just in New York City, but across America. Everybody who is committed um, to doing something different to the way the traditional publishing model works, right? Uh, whether it's through collaboration, whether it's through supporting emerging voices, um, we focus on a whole lot of that. Um, I am sharing the Radix Media URL for those of you who haven't had a chance to check us out in the past. Uh, feel free to visit our website um, to get a sense of who we are. Um, all of our books that we've published are available on our website uh, to order. They're also available on bookshop and wherever indie books are available you're also welcome to call your favorite bookstore and ensure that they get copies of the books that you would like from radix media uh we are very sorry that today's event could not happen in person although we are very glad that all of us are hopefully safe and dry in our respective homes. Uh, we would have loved the chance to meet with all of you in person, to be in company with all of you for many different reasons. One, just to be in person is great. We get to hang out before, we get to hang out after, we get to have a bunch of conversations. That's always nice. But also because of the very cool venue that we've partnered with for today's event, the City Reliquary in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Those of you who've had a chance to go to the City Reliquary know what a cool and special place it is. Um, it is a lovely community space that has relics going back to New York's past. It's weird little trinkets. Um, it's forgotten um, artifacts. Um, and it's just a really special place, uh, both for events and community engagement. I want to invite the founder, Dave Herman, who is here in the chat, to share a little bit about the space um, and, you know, inspire you all to attend on your next outing of, out and about the city. Dave, please. God. Maher, thank you so much. It's, I'm very grateful for the invitation uh, and grateful for people like you who are uh, creative people that come and bring your energy to our space. And uh, like us, you've done an amazing job at pivoting uh, and having to adjust from you know, uh, the uh, inability to come in person and do the Zoom. So thank you so much for joining. Um, but yeah, just to mention a little bit about our space before you guys really dive into the, the tonight's events. Um, <clears throat> I did uh, begin the City Reliquary Museum just uh, shortly after 9-11 uh, in 2002. And uh, in many ways, it was sort of personally for me a way to sort of give something back to the city 
uh, something, you know, as, as immensely positive as I could offer. Um, and I've often said that the city is kind of has a wealth of gifts to give us. And it's sort of our jobs as, as individuals to go out there and seek those gifts out and, and claim them for ourselves so that we can use them as energy or, or fuel to return them back into the community and uh, sort of make it full circle. Uh, so that's what I always have hoped that the city relic were, would be. And I get a lot of credit, as you said, as the founder, but really um, I owe I owe what it is now today to people like you who are using the space and turning it into what it what the dream was for it originally. I, I often say, you know, it's kind of like the snowball effect. I was lucky enough to get this little snowball pushing down the hill and and it has picked up momentum. Uh, so far be it from me to take all the credit for the hard work that you guys do in, in uh, contributing as well. Uh, so I, I uh, was also generously asked to share some links with you. And so I threw those into the chat. Uh, the first one is how you can become a member. Uh, a lot of what has helped us survive many of the challenges, in particular the COVID challenge uh, for us has been membership. And so we offer events, um, whether they be panel discussions or bar mitzvahs or burlesque shows and everything in between. Um, and members are able to get into the majority of these events for free. Uh, and we also have that same link allows people to give a one-time donation if you're interested. Uh, but most likely, uh, more than anything, we would really like to see people come and appreciate the space in person, because that's what we're all about. It's not so much about telling the history on the internet and, and the web as much as putting those real objects um, out there for people to feel a sort of tactile connection to. Um, so and that's kind of our history in a nutshell. The other link that I put up there uh, is to our podcast, which we are fortunate enough to have worked with. Uh, our The host is Tanya Mohammed, who uh, worked with Citizen Race Car, which is a producing uh, podcast production company. And they uh, just recently completed the first uh, season of our podcast. And they basically choose artifacts from our museum and then do a deep dive into the stories behind each of them and link the object with a person that has a personal connection. Um, and so you can really get a sense of what we what we display at the museum there and um, what we hope to be preserving uh, over time. Um, so so that's that's kind of what we have going on. And I really appreciate everybody uh, being involved and, and checking us out. So thanks for uh, having me join you virtually today. Thank you so much, Dave, for sharing that. Um, there's particularly something compelling about a city known for its museums, uh, for its really big, massive structures with, uh, you know, those incredible entry fee to have a space that's entirely community run and fueled that you can go visit at any time. And that has um, relics of um, the strange forgotten parts of the city. And so there's something really deeply compelling about that. And I could, I wish I could describe you the feeling of being at City Reliquary, but I think I, the best way I could say it is strange romanticism. Um, there's something very deeply romantic, but also weird about being there and it's best experienced in person. I have to echo uh, Dave here. So I will encourage you all to go check out the space. It's a very lovely time spent. Um, on that note, uh, I wanna also talk a little bit. We're now gonna move towards the panel, um, but before, I introduce our wonderful panelists and guests today. Um, I do have to say that we felt really sorry that we couldn't meet, be with you all in person. And we were quite sad uh, that we don't get to Congress and assemble uh, and chat and, and hang out. And so we have a little bit of an offer for you. From today until Monday, you can use the coupon code bookend on the Radix Media website and get anything with a 10% discount. Right, it is available for all of you people who are joining this particular uh, uh, this particular event, as well as anybody who has always been curious about Radix Media work, and you can get that until Monday. Or on Sunday, you can also come visit our booth at the Brooklyn Book Festival. Remember, it's a free literary event uh, where there's going to be a bunch of publishers all under 
the roof, which is the sky, because we're all open to, um, you know, the forces of nature. But there's all going to be all these publishers and journals and authors. There's events. There's all free events. So feel free to come hang out. It's a good day spent in the city. And we're at booth 603. Uh, so you're w welcome to come say hi, introduce yourself. If you're a writer, please tell us about your work. If you are interested in our books or our stationery, please come and check them out. On that note, we will now move on to our incredible panel, who will now take it from here uh, and uh, engage us in an incredible conversation about what it means to write as an Arab American writer in the political minefield that is America. It's very interesting that Dave mentioned the founding of uh, City Reliquary post 9-11 because it feels like it's a, such a mom momentous time in American history. Um, and it's always a moment that, as we know, even from you know a few weeks ago that we return to uh, with great enthusiasm for different reasons, right? We all have different reasons to return to that date, to recall that date. Um, and it's particularly telling how the Arab American identity has shaped and moved and evolved in the wake of this international crisis. Um, and for us at uh, Radix Media, we've had the privilege to publish a bunch of incredible Arab American writers, two of whom are in on the panel today, Ginwa Javhari, who is moderating the panel, and Zain Al Amin, um, and several others that you can check out on our catalog. Um, and what has always moved us is the resilience of those narratives, is uh, the incredible persistence of writing and depicting both a uh, diasporic life in America, but also life as one remembers in um, the countries and the regions that they're from, um, especially in a country that seeks to erase and diminish one's identity and culture. And so it is to that resilience that we tip our hat um, and we come uh, with gratitude for this panel. I'm very excited to introduce to you our esteemed panelists for today's evening. I'm gonna read their bios really quickly and then I'm gonna hand the mic over to our moderator. So give me a second as I pull up their bios. Okay, perfect. Um, our first panelist for today is Andrea Abikaram, who is a trans Arab American punk poet performer cyborg. They are the author of Extra Transmission from Kelsey Street Press 2019. And with Kay Gabriel, they co-edited We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics from Nightboat Books 2020. Their second book, Villainy, also available at Nightboat Books, September 2021, reimagines militant collectivity in the wake of the ghost ship fire and the Muslim ban. They are currently working on a poet's novel. Welcome, Andrea. Um, our next panelist for today is the incredible George Abraham. George Abraham is a Palestinian American poet. Their debut poetry collection, Birthright, from Button Poetry 2020, won the Arab American Book Award and was a Lambda Literary Award finalist. They are currently executive editor for Misna and are a recipient of fellowships from Kundiman, the Arab American National Museum, Savani Writers Conference, National Performance Network, and more. They are currently co-editing a Palestinian global Anglophone poetry anthology with Noor Hindi at Haymarket Books 2024, and are a, a Leitowitz MFA plus MA candidate at Northwestern University. George, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, our next panelist is Hazem Fami, who is a writer and critic from Cairo, a PhD student in Middle Eastern Studies at Columbia University. He runs the literary newsletter Wasth El Balad on Substack. His latest chapbook, At the Gates, was published by the African Poetry Book Fund, Akashic Books, as part of the 2023 edition of the New Generation African Poets series. His debut chapbook, Red Jilled Prayer won the 2017 Diode Editions Contest, and his second, Waiting for Frank Ocean in Cairo, was published in 2022 by Half Mystic Press. A Kundaman and Watering Hole Fellow, his writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the Best American Poetry 2020, The Boston Review, Prairie Schooner, Movie Notebook, Reverse Shot, and Mizna. Welcome, Hazem. Um, our next writer is the wonderful Zain El Amin, who is a Lebanese-born poet and writer. He has an MFA in poetry from the University of Maryland. 
His poems have appeared in Wild River Review, Folio, Beltway Quarterly, Foreign Policy in Focus, City Lit, and others. His latest poetry manuscript, A Tra Travel Guide for the Exiled, was recently shortlisted for the Bergman Prize, judged by Louise Gluck. His short stories have appeared in Uno Mas, Jadalia, Middle East Report, Wild River Review, About Place Journal, and In Bound Off. His debut short story collection, Is This How You Eat a Watermelon, was published by Radix Media and was longlisted for the Penn Awards Robert W. Bingham Prize for Debut Short Fiction. Wonderful to have you here, Zane. Our next panelist is Sara Aziza, who is a Palestinian-American writer who splits her time between New York City and the Middle East. She has lived and worked in Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Jordan, South Africa, and the West Bank, in addition to the United States. Her journalism, poetry, essays, and experimental nonfiction have appeared in The New Yorker, The Baffler, Harper's Magazine, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Lux Magazine, The Intercept, The Rumpus, NPR, Washington Post, and The Nation, among others. Previously a Fulbright Fellow in Jordan, she's the recipient of numerous Pulitzer Center grants for crisis reporting, a 2022 resident at Tin House Writers Workshop, and a 2023 Margins Fellow at the Asian American Writers Workshop. Her first book is forthcoming from Catapult Books and is a hybrid work of memoir, lyricism, and oral history, exploring the intertwined legacies of diaspora, colonialism, and the American dream. I'm very thrilled also to introduce to you our panelist, uh, our moderator, sorry, for today's event, the incredible Ginwa Johari, who is a Lebanese American writer based in Brooklyn, New York. Her debut chapbook, Bint 2021, was selected for Radix Media's Own Voices Chapbook Prize. A recipient of fellowships from Kundiman and the Asian American Writers Workshop, she is the founding editor of Kaukash Review. Her essays, fiction, and poetry appear in Catapult, Misna, The Adroit Journal, Rusted Radishes, The Margins, Narrative, and elsewhere. More at ginwajavari.com, and you can find them at, on IG at BB Ganuj, which I think is one of the funniest, awesome, most awesome uh, IG handles. Um, I'm sorry if that was like really quick and I went too fast. I'm also sharing all of the bios in the chat I will be sharing as the conversation goes on. And so you will have access to them and you can read them and you can check out the writer's work on the respective platforms. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic over to the incredible Ginwa Johari who is gonna take over this panel and guide it. Um, thank you all for joining in and I hope you all have a wonderful time. Thank you, Meher. Um... Every time Meher introduces me, we, I just had a reading with her before and she always ends with my Instagram name. And it's hilarious to like hear it said back to me. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm sad we're not in person, but I do have some wine. And so if you drink, I encourage you to drink with us. Um, I'm really honored to be moderating this group of people who I adore and love, um, both, you know, as writers, but also as personal friends of mine. Um, we will have time for a, you know, Q&A uh, at the end. So if you have questions, uh, definitely reach out. You can drop them in the chat. Um, I want to start with, uh, I have my notes here. So if I look down, I apologize. But I did print them out because I bought a printer recently and I was so excited about the purchase. And I've just been printing everything and it's been great. So um, so I wanted, I wanted to start with a note uh, on the word Arab in this panel, which I feel like we have to kind of address since that word has kind of, changed and continues to change. Um, traditionally, of course, all of us would be uh, considered, or consider our countries of origin to be like the Middle East or the Near East. And then we started asking, well, middle according to whom, or like near according to whom. And so that's where this term Swana or Southwest Asian North African uh, came up. Swana was meant to be, I think, you know, more inclusive, especially if you're from those regions, but don't identify as Arab. Um, as an Arab, I'm going to use Arab and Swana interchangeably, but I, I invite you to kind of interpret them both however you'd like um and uh yeah the discussion around uh nomenclature is important <laughs> so uh so we should we should talk about it right um and so that brings me actually to my first question we were talking about september um but in what ways has uh the arab swana writing landscape changed over the course of your artistic career or the course of your life how have your own narratives changed in response to a smaller and more globalized world? 
I would ask you to consider if and how writing now is different than how it was maybe writing a decade or two ago, um, or even a few years ago. How does that continue to change? I think what we're going to do is have the reaction. So I will keep a lookout for whoever wants to answer first. Um, we're all so polite. <laughs> Should I just call on you? Maybe I should do that instead. Of... Can, can you also repeat the question one more time? Yeah, sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Is that okay? Yeah, okay. So so the question was, in what ways has Arab or Swana writing landscape changed? Has the Swana writing landscape changed over the course of your artistic career or over the course of your life? How has How have your own narratives changed in response to a smaller or more globalized world? I would ask you to consider how and if you're writing now is different than it was before, maybe a decade ago, or however you want to imagine it. Um, what has been the change for you? If any, it could be the same, yeah. I, I, could, uh, I could start, uh, yeah. uh, you know, some uh, a writer once said that once you publish a book, it's like a, a pilot light. It keeps on sparking new things for you uh and uh um that was like i uh, in terms of arab american literature i just maybe it's because um i met uh, all these people along the book tour uh but i've been really amazed at how first of all like in my own area uh, uh basically arab poets are taking over virginia uh we have the poet laureate for uh uh, for Fairfax County as Daniel Badra. And then we have uh, the poet laureate for Alexandria as Zaina Azam. And they were both appointed in the same year, probably within a few months of each other. Um, and uh, um, the, then there is like, uh, when I started to get, uh, to started to read uh, the America's Review and Mizna, uh, congratulations, uh, George, on your uh, position with Mizna. Um, uh, which actually just won uh, an award for design, right? Um, but it, th these were like aesthetically in content in every way, far beyond anything I've seen in terms of Arab American. Uh, 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 well, it's the only, this is the first ones that I've, uh, I've seen with that kind of distribution, with that kind of resources and all that. So that's another thing that I've noticed in terms of changes. Uh, the then there's uh, uh, this anthology that just came out of Arab uh, American poets that Hala and and Zaina had put together and edited. Uh, most of us here are on it, uh, uh, and it's it's something that's been a long time coming. And I love the fact that that it's it focuses on. Uh, love poems because we're always asked to write about war and misery and God knows what. Uh, but uh, uh, I love that and and I love it also. I'm I'm taking some of that poetry to an event that actually Rinwa and I are gonna attend in December, which is the Howard Zinn Book Festival Book Fair in San Francisco, um, uh, uh, because. The whole the 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 workshop we're doing is is titled something like uh, sometimes uh, sometimes the <laughs> Lebanese vampire is just a Lebanese vampire. Then and and hopefully we'll feature uh, you know it's it comes from a Lebanese director who insisted that his vampire film is just about a Lebanese vampire. It has nothing to do with war or symbolism, even though the French reporters kept on insisting that it has, it, it's, it, it must be about something else if you're Lebanese. Uh, but it's, it's just about the, you know, the saying that, uh, uh, that the poem that was uh, basically uh, 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 that goes beyond the, the battle of good and evil, there's a, there's a field. And, I, I want to be in that field, <laughs> uh, not not just in the battle of good and evil. Even though I'm 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 perfectly fit for that, but <laughs> uh, I I want to get into that field, and that's what I see Arab American writers is going into that field. Uh, that's that's my two cents. 
kind of escaping a, a grid that was made for us or that has been preconceived. Yeah, I feel that way also. Um, who else would like to add to things? I guess I can also um, bounce off this too, especially like given like, um, I feel like uh, everyone in this room, uh, in this panel, I've intersected at very different uh, stages of my writing life. You know, Hazim is one of my first and oldest friends uh, back when we were in the slam poetry scene in college together to, um, you know, Andrew, I met shortly thereafter at the first rally in 2018. And then um, uh, we Zane around that time too, when we, when um, I went on your radio program, then a few years later, Renoir through the pandemic, uh, and then Sada <laughs> recently, and now we're writing letters together. So it's just interesting seeing like almost a timeline um, of people. Uh, yes, Hazem stands rise up, absolutely. Um, but in, in in that, I think me and Hazem had this, uh, not falling out, I, I guess, but like just reckoning, I think, with um, the tropes of slam poetry and especially like Arab identity refracted through like slam poetry weirdness um and we both were on like I think our third cupsy team at that point we were just like I'm so tired of the same like rehash identity politics poems over and over and over again um, and, and then it's like are we getting canceled for saying that oh my gosh like um and then like little did we know it's like oh my god so many people are like you know jaded I don't know it's weird we all like are living the same trajectories just on different you know time scales and whatnot but um yeah after um embarking on this several now three year long journey to edit um this anthology with Noor for Haymarket um which uh is now has a title based on a certain someone in the chat named Fargo Tabaki um the title of the anthology I'm pretty comfortable to announce is Heaven Looks Like Us um which is a line of uh from Fargo but um thinking about that um after like we read the open slush pile of like thousands of poems submitted it was like oh my god this is so beautiful and also I never want to see a poem about an olive tree ever again <laughs> like I am like physically nauseated every time I see the word olive tree on a piece of paper now because I've read a thousand of the same exact poems over and over and over and over again um and um you know it got to the point where it's like um, just resurrecting a conversation that Leila Abdul Razak sort of started with me back in 2019 of like, how are we thinking beyond these sort of closed nationalistic symbols when we're thinking about Palestine? Um, how are we troubling them? How are we like honoring their history? There's a reason that the olive tree and the watermelon and the flag and the keys, there's a reason and like a big deep history behind why these symbols are in, entrenched in our um, literary tradition, uh, what are we doing to reimagine them? What are we doing to sort of continue that work and push it forward instead of, you know, I am the olive tree, <laughs> the diaspora poem all over again. Um, and uh, so that's kind of, I think, the craft question of our generation, for sure. I mean, political too, but yeah, uh, it's a it's a multifaceted um, question, I think, that I'm I'm excited to see a lot of our generation um handling that and uh someone who's actually not in our generation uh, like she published her debut a bit older like in the middle of her life Sarah Cypher wrote this amazing novel called The Skin and Its Girl which takes some of this Palestinian symbolism um and does a really great queer intergenerational like um kind of like fairy tale-esque novel um based on these symbols and uh really 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 I'll just drop the name in the chat uh for folks but uh, that's another great example, I think, of someone who's doing innovative work sort of around this, acknowledging and uplifting the history while also like pushing it into a new register, I think. Breaking away without maybe rejecting or, yeah, yeah. Because it's never about disavowing, you know, yeah. like. Yeah, a although, although we can feel that way because you have Arab guilt and why don't I want to be an olive? What does that say about me? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, who else? We have three more. I can hop on. Um, yeah. Thank you for this question. I think um, to reference what you mentioned, George, about Rowie in 2018, that was a big moment for me personally as a writer, being able to find like Swana writer community was something I'd been very, very thirsty for. And during my MFA program, I um, was heavily invested in 
and still am in documentary poetics, but I, there weren't any, I, the MFA failed to give me like models for like Arab and Swana um, documentary poetics, basically like any, everything I was seeing was like white documentary poetics. And so being able to meet people at Rowie and meet queer, like queer Swana people at Rowie was like completely transformative for like feeling like I had a home in this like amazing literary landscape. And to speak to about your point, George, around um, stereotyping is like, we're all very amazing, brilliant writers. And it's so, I feel like coming up against this a lot, both being queer and trans and Arab, like wanting so badly to for my more complicated work to be appreciated by like non trans wanna readers, which is feels like a perpetual challenge. That's a that's a really good point also is like how do we interpret queerness when um when there is that backdrop of, of the symbols and things that we have to write about or are expected to write about. Yeah. Thank you. As in Sarah. I can I can give a shot at this. Um, thank you for the question. My background is in journalism, um, so I think my um, rupture kind of comes from trying for a few years to make a name for myself, or you know, just kind of get ahead in the journalism world while identifying as an Arab American author. Um, I had like a series of reckonings. Um, the first of which was I was identifying myself as Arab and not Palestinian. And that was a self-protective act. It came from like a lot of trauma and a lot of erasure and resistance to my identity as a Palestinian. Um, and I was sort of advised to sort of make myself more palatable um, as an Arab American writer or journalist. Um, and in, in my first few years, I, I had a lot of success, which was surprising and exciting, but I realized kind of quickly that it was on another set of terms, not my own set of terms. Um, I remember one of my first um, print pieces was for Harper's Magazine. I was like a first year a graduate student and I, I got commissioned to do this piece on, on women athletes in Saudi Arabia. I, I used to live in Saudi Arabia. So for me, this is like a very familiar and nuanced and cool scene to investigate. Um, and I brought back what I thought was like a cast of characters that were really amazing and unique and, um, basically the edits came back and they were they were flattened and they were cut out and they were I was asked to add things about their hijabs and all of that and it was just you know one frustration one trope like being imposed um, after another and I think journalism just has like a faster metabolism and even more I feel like market pressure um, so I think that my ability to break away from that really came not from like a desire to to assert myself um, originally, but like a, a refusal to flatten other people. Um, you know, like shortly thereafter, I was reporting on Syrian refugees, same thing. I, I, I went and like lived with this like female run, like group of refugees who had all lost their sons and husbands to the war. And it was like this amazing, like pseudo feminist, like indigenous feminist phenomenon. And I was so excited to write about it. And um, that also didn't fit into the molds. And, you know, same thing, there's quotas, they did their serious story for the year, just so I think I, I was extremely burnt out and frustrated with with all of that. And um, again, like I said, I didn't want to flatten these folks. It was not it was one thing to flatten myself, but I I, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm like it was a it was a weird blessing of the pandemic to kind of hit pause on some like big international like reporting projects I had going on. And I just sort of like entered a stage of deconstruction. Um, it's when I moved into the more creative space. It's when I kind of like came out as Palestinian. And um, yeah, I've just kind of been on this tear of like trying to be weirder and more complex and more guerrilla on the page. A lot of my writing deals with like reclaiming the archives and um, just kind of like answering directly back to um, some of these narratives that have been imposed. So, yeah. That's awesome. Like the um, refusing <laughs> again. Flat, like the flattening that like gets me why do you want to hear about the hijab anyway like when we write about it you don't like it um uh, <laughs> exactly has it um similarly to Sara, um i'm also a uh creative writer um in a field in another field with uh very different approaches to writing to uh conceptualizing uh terms to flattening or lack thereof um 
But what was interesting in in sort of my relationship with uh, what we might call like Arab American spaces or that identity or that construct is that my consciousness of it was formed, uh, like George said, when we were when we were in Slam. Like that was really when I started thinking about it and encountering it. Um, and of course, that is uh, an incredibly liberal space, uh, an incredibly um, uh, 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 identity oriented space, but particular identity in a very shallow, commodified way um, that is meant to to repackage your experience in in this little three minute thing that you then give out in the world. And particularly the era we were in, um, there were uh, there were particular stakes to it because you could theoretically make money off of that. You could get on certain platforms and then get a little tour um and and that kind of commodification could result in um and you being monetarily awarded for it obviously you can still do that <laughs> in, in different aspects of of literature and creative work um but i uh sort of my identity formation was uh, uh was in a space that was uh really keen on monetizing these kinds of experiences and this kinds of politicization, um, even, of course, as it would never present it that way and it denied that that is what it was doing. Um, and so a really interesting uh, uh, development that I've that I've been uh, undergoing for a few years in uh, my other big field, ac academia, is, uh, and, and particularly because I'm uh, uh, in, it's, for, for context, I do, I do film studies, but I'm currently based in an area studies department. So like questions of discipline, of space, of geography are always very relevant. Um, and, and one thing, if, if you're, um, in, particularly if you're being, you know, guided by, uh, people who are not themselves doing the flattening or not themselves invested in, in, uh, in these kinds of, uh, um, very uh, normative assumptions about what what places are, what peoples are, what larger categories are. Um, when you enter an academic space like that, you you're very quickly like, well, shit, everything's made up. Like every every name you have for for any place that is like bigger than a village is is a is is some kind of construct. Um, like one of uh, 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 my advisor loves to stress that like it's it's it, it's actually quite wild that we still stick to the name Europe when that is just a corner of Asia. It's, it's just a, it's just Western Asia, but we've completely accepted that Europe is, is, is not only this distinct region, but it's also um, a, a continent somehow. It's literally the same landmass. Um, and so over the last few years, I've been um, moving very, I've been sprinting away from the kind of like, Oh well, this term is a construct, man, because it all is like nothing. There, there is no term that doesn't collapse under scrutiny. Um, and I've been much more invested in thinking of, well, what is this term doing? What is it actually uh, helping? Either in terms of, you know, if it's on the more academia side, then a like intellectual framework. If it's on the creative uh, side, then a more uh, um, uh, like an entry point into understanding something. And obviously these two things are in totally separate spheres. Um, they always overlap. And of course, politically, um, how is this term actually helping me build uh, uh, relationships, uh, build solidarity to actually move towards something that is uh, that is productive? And so I've become very divested from the sort of the Arab as as olive tree yes. <laughs> um, or in my case I'm, I'm Egyptian the like ugh, I I wept over my mother's kushari as I remembered the night like that shit I've I've completely uh disinvested myself from and I'm, I'm much more uh what I'm much more invested in is um the actual I mean still living it's not dead it never it never died but it, they sure tried to kill it. Uh, the actual like histories of uh, regional solidarity of, uh, of thinking beyond these insane borders um, that have been colonially imposed, um, thinking 
um beyond the uh uh like George mentioned earlier like like the the sort of the 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 absurd limitations of nationalist dialogue um and and thinking about like what does it actually uh, uh what are we actually sort of getting out of these relationships and what are we hoping out of them um and so yeah I'm not I'm not invested in in sort of building uh uh relationships with other people who identify uh in in the same way like for the for the sake of it but it's more towards it's more about like what are we actually what are we actually working towards and like what is the 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 thing that is holding us together yeah and who is who is creating the framework who has decided to to use the terminology and to what end right so yeah these are all really good answers. Thank you, guys. Um, I had like, I guess this is, I guess it leads into the next question. Um, but it's still like everything that I have is about frameworks, Hazem. Okay, so you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to entertain me for a little bit. Um, I'm really curious about uh, who the reader is in your brains, and it could be that it's just yourself or a younger version of yourself or another whatever, somebody who identifies as you, Andrea, to your point, like perhaps another like trans queer, you know, by like um, Arab reader, but maybe you're trying to break out of that. Uh, how often does like the white or American reader pop on, into your head when you're creating? How often does the Arab or, or um, other reader pop into your head when you're creating? If they do at all, it could be that they don't. Um, but to what extent do you find yourself maybe needing to over explain or censure? And then in the editing, does that, do you need to go back and change? Um, I'm curious about uh, kind of processes of creation and like, who are you writing towards? And is this something that you reflect on and then change? Um, Cause this is something actually I struggle with myself and uh, yeah, give me some advice. Like <laughs> what's, what's that like? I might pick on Zayn again, but I won't. <laughs> I can start. George, um, okay, cool, yeah. My advisor, uh, Daisy Hernandez, um, has a saying that, which is, especially for nonfiction, um, write your emotional draft. <laughs> um, and so um, she, for every single memoir chapter, um, she's challenged me to be like, write this uncensored, write this like as if there is no reader, write this as long as it needs to be. Um, and because honestly, it's it's always surprised me. It's like, it's a simple thing, but actually like fully committing. Like when you are like three quarters of the way through a outline that you made for yourself for this chapter. And then like you realize, oh, wait, there's a way more interesting story and it actually begins here, you know, and giving yourself that permission to just go in and <laughs> um, and write it, even if you're not going to use it, quote unquote, or, you know, be productive, quote unquote, about your writing, um, like 10,000 words of useless writing to get to like one amazing realization is always worth it um and again that comes from the privilege of being like yeah I am in an MFA that's funded what and all that so like I do have the time and you know resources and so like the question I guess I now have is like how to translate that to like working and being in the real world that's not like <laughs> an MFA and not like a you know um this sort of institutional um uh funded time and whatnot but um but that said, I do think that there is a like really generative thing about just having no rules and just letting yourself give yourself that freedom to explore. But sometimes a very, very opposite answer, sometimes just taking like, let's like invent a white person on the page, just like, you know, like, you know how cats like are like little sociopaths that they just like have their prey in a cage and like then they'll just like chase the prey around and like play with like psychologically torture it before they like eat it and kill it you know <laughs> you could just like do that to a white person I don't know on the page I guess <laughs> um, but like um no but sometimes like you know my my good friend Fargo who's also in the chat being a hater is so productive sometimes too um and having that just like space to be like no I'm gonna like be extremely petty and I'm gonna be extreme like you 
know um and it doesn't even have to be like real per se like it can just be like fun and like ooh, let's like let's just throw this person there <laughs> you know uh or whatnot or let's let's put a discourse out there and like you know um i don't know you'd be surprised what that can lead just give yourself permission to just be a hater um even if no one sees it um so yeah those are two very extreme ends of the spectrum answers i think <laughs> about the cat playing with the prey um when I was I'm going to tell a story about my MFA so I if you've read extra transmission you know there's a whole section dedicated to like violent murders of murdering bros and they're very graphic um and this was very cathartic for me to write and the first time I brought one into workshop during my MFA the professor said these are so violent and I was like well bros are violent like the henchmen of the patriarchy are violent like this is a poem yes it's powerful but it you know it's it's not the actual knife or screwdriver or whatever and having that and the professor like was not was not a white professor and so having this moment was like and he was also queer so having this moment of like tension in the workshop around like I was like fully kind of no rules no sort of like MFA white canon I was just really finally writing like what I wanted to write and there was pushback from the institutional end of things and so of course I like continued writing the Kilbro poems <laughs> and um about audiences I'm I feel really lucky in that I'm a I'm a Leo and I always am very confident that there will be an audience that like my work will find its way into the right readers which um I think uh, is really, which I feel lucky to have this feeling. And I think it's really important to make sure you make publishing choices as writers with people who will care for your work. And I've had the opportunity to work with Kelsey Street and Nightboat and lots of queer authors and lots of queer staff on in those um, publishing houses. And that's been really important because if you go, if you go super bigger market sometimes you don't get creative license over your title you don't get creative license over your cover they tell you to like flatten your characters which I'm a poet so it's not that doesn't really <laughs> that might not happen to me but um I think it like the internet is like an endless sieve that will just take and take and take from you in terms of publishing and I think it's really important to be intentional about where you place your work because you can only produce so much work It's so good. Uh, such good advice. And also starting with, I'm a Leo. So <laughs> um, Sarah, you had your, you had your unmute, go for it. Sure. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I want to echo both of those um, opinions, try and harness some of that Leo energy. Um, I just, I'm hearing like reject gentility, domesticity. Um, I definitely wrestle with the question of audience a lot. Um, I I think it was last summer when I realized there was one particular white older male professor that was like vividly living in my brain and was like sitting on my shoulder. And sometimes like there are multiple days in the week that I still have to like pick him up and like carry him out of the room and like leave him there. Um, which, you know, it's, it's okay because I, I know that that's a part of my writing practice now. Um, it sucks, but he has no place in, in this, in this room. I've done my like stint of appeasing those folks. He's, you know, someone who, yeah, used to really love my work and we don't talk anymore. So, um, I mean, it's fine. Like we just don't have anything to say anymore. We're in different worlds now. Um, but the question of like who replaces those people, um, is like an open question for me, but my gut tells me that I'm either writing, you know, sometimes I'm writing to a version of my of my younger self who needed to hear what I'm trying to discover and uncover and collate through experience and intellect and a lot of reading um, through my writing. And then other times, and this is like more frequently the case, I'm writing towards like the most virtuosic, virtuosic, virtuosic. Um, like excellent BIPOC writers who are like my patron saints. So I have like a whole like Mount Olympus of of the folks that like 
I'm in awe of their writing and I like need to revisit them. And I don't think I'll ever like approach them, but um, I'm writing towards them and I'm doing my best to like make them proud. And then I'm also writing towards like the community that I've met who I also deeply admire and and love. And like Vinwa, you've been in that room at times, George, you too, like just like what would, you know, if I feel myself trying to like go 80% because I think going a hundred would be too complex or difficult or striving, you know, I'm just like, no, like, I've seen both of you do it. I know that you're you're out there like doing doing it. Um, like let's just like aim for like the the best we can do. Um, yeah, I love that. Um, that's yeah, good point. Has you took off your mute before I could. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> what uh, uh, Andrew just said really resonated with me on multiple levels. Um, because I, uh, literally the other, the other day I, uh, got some edits on a poem that is, well, given these edits, we'll see if it's, <laughs> if, it's if it's forthcoming publication, but there is, um, there is, uh, uh, you know, without, without getting into the whole thing, there's basically, there's a line about, um, killing Wall Street executives. And even that line is redacted, like it's in it's in ball, it's in black um, highlights and um, the editor asked to take it out. And I was like, absolutely not. Absolutely fucking not. <laughs> this is um, it, it's 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 already. Uh, you know, this, like, 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 like we can't even say this on the poem, like even in this in this little playful, uh, silly place, we can't we can't even we can't even imagine this. Um, and it's, it's, and, 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 and weaving that in also that Andrea said about the, 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 that response in, in that workshop, like what, what I'm usually, uh, afraid of, or, or the sort of the, the, the reader that I'm worried about is, um, is not specifically, uh, a white reader. It's the liberal reader, um, which is absolutely not only, not only white, um, that includes uh you know like active like misinterpretation of my work like active weaponization of my work either um either against me or for things that i i do not support um like a very sort of common uh, uh an anxiety i sometimes have is like i write i write something that's sort of very specifically about my experience my perspective and someone's like and someone interprets that as like, wow, you're speaking to the Egyptian community. I'm not. I don't know what the Egyptian community is. That's a country with 100 million people. There are millions of, of Egyptians in this country alone. Um, when I write, uh, I, I have to say, like, also, I relate it a lot to what, what Sarah said, because uh, overwhelmingly, when when I write, I am, uh, I'm thinking of myself, really. Like, I am thinking of what what do I wish like was around for me for me to read um and 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 for me the, the way I see that it's it's not it's not even in the sense of you know something that I like like sometimes it's things that I needed but a lot of times it's just like what is what what do I think would be pleasurable to read that I don't that I'm not really seeing around or or I, or I have seen but but I think it would be cool to integrate it with this other idea with this other form um, with these other set of aesthetic motifs or what have you. Um, and so for, for me, when I'm thinking about, <laughs> exactly, I see Sora's response, like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't want to be like a, a representative of anyone. I, I don't think that's possible. I don't, I'm not, I'm not working towards that. I'm not invested in that. Um, I want to, um, like, like I, I can only sort of think through what, um I can I like I can personally enjoy and then beyond that like at most I will write to my dear friends I will write something and you know share it with George and I have done like with George and and Fargo or or like um we uh me and George have a, have a dear mutual friend Lara Atallah who's a, a Lebanese uh poet and uh a graphic designer um and like for one of her uh she invited me to join her for for her book launch uh, a few months ago, and um, I it was like I'm 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 so tired of my poems. I'm gonna write a new one like just for that launch. Like that that's that's sort of the kind of the kind of event or the kind of person that I would write something for, um, or or uh, uh, write towards. 
but in terms of something larger than that, um, I I just I don't I, I don't think I can write to the to the Egyptians <laughs> at large. I you know, I I hope some you know if they come across my writing like they they enjoy it and maybe find something relatable. But but I I I I don't set that as the goal because I don't think it's uh, it's achievable. I was at that launch and it was a really good poem that has them wrote also. It was about like the, uh, was something Middle Eastern studies like thing or something in Colombia and you were like tearing, he tore them a new one, you guys. It was, it was really good. The equivalent of shooting a Wall Street bro, I think, um, or whatever the, the thing. Zain, you're, you're next. Yeah, what do you, what do you think? Uh, first of all, I wanted to tell Hazem that I'm teaching a, a course on contemporary poetry at Georgetown University and the second presentation. So we have, I have my list of uh, poets that they have to read, including they have to read Bint Renoir's book <laughs> and they have to, um, uh, so uh, that was, that's one of the 10 kind of books that I required, but I asked them to present on their favorite um, on their favorite po poet. And the second presentation was uh, about you, Hazem, by an Egyptian uh, American <laughs> student. And it was, I have to send you the slide because uh, I told them I'm going to steal it because it's such a great, uh, you know, my trick is to let the, the students teach and I'll pick the best of it and I'll use it the next semester. <laughs> uh, but uh, But it's such a great, it's such a beautiful presentation and people loved it. Uh, people loved your stuff. And he he has this he has this poem that's highlighted in three different colors with three different like and every color represents some aspect of the poem. It's just it's just a beautiful thing. I just wanted to tell you that. Uh, also, another thing that came up is, uh, George, you mentioned that uh, Daisy Hernandez is your advisor the writer yes the, yeah. Yeah, the, so, <laughs> yes yeah. the David Hernandez, sorry. yeah yeah so uh, uh i know her uh, because i have i used to have these and this relates to the i'm actually answering your question Renoir. uh <laughs> this is this is relates to audience and I, I mostly write poetry i wrote poetry before i started to write uh, uh write down short stories and one of the reasons I started to write down the short stories is because I used to have this uh, Sunday tea and I would ask people to come. I say, I'm going to put the pot on, you know, double boiler Turkish tea. Uh, I'll put the pot on at four and I'll take it off at six. And whoever comes, comes and you can stay past six, but the tea stays on for two hours. Uh, and then we, you know, if there's, uh, three people can show up or 15. I don't know because I don't ask for RSVPs. And if there's a, also like it goes on to dinner, it becomes a, what, what we call a sahara, right? Where we talk about literature, art, poetry, everything. And the people that came because I'm an activist, they were activists, they were artists, they were, and they were from different backgrounds, from Latin America, from the Arab world, from uh, here, you know, everywhere. And so one day, uh, 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 Daisy comes, Daisy Hernandez comes for tea because she's invited by my neighbor down the street. And uh, um, she, uh, 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 she she sits there and I started, I, I always take advantage. Of course, we're writers. Tea means holding court, right? <laughs> and uh, so I start telling these stories. And so when she left, uh, my friend calls me and she says, Daisy Hernandez asked me to put a recorder hidden behind the cushion at the next tea because these stories should be recorded. And I told her they don't need to be recorded because I'm writing them. And so that's uh, that like that was my audience. That's how it was determined. <laughs> that's what I, who I was writing to. These were avid readers, but they came from different backgrounds, you know. Yeah. I love that answer, Zayn. Uh, I want to go to a tea sahra in DC. I would take the train for that, like very, <laughs> very much. Uh, They're starting again now that it's fall. Amazing! So, yeah, I'm waiting. Can't. I'm waiting for the for the invite. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm looking at. It's eight oh seven. Mero, do we have? What do we have time for? When are we ending? 
Um, I think we can do one more question, um, sort of an embedded two-tier question if need be, um, and then we can uh, sort of graduate to Q&A. Uh, okay. I want to give space for the audience to respond and ask questions. Uh, and so as uh, the next question is going on, here's to the folks in the room. Please feel free to add any questions you have in the chat and then um, uh, we, uh, you know, we can call upon you to share them vocally if need be. Yeah, that's good. Um, I Okay, so I guess one question for all of you on the panel that you can just like write in the chat is like a book or a work of art that you would recommend. And you can kind of do that as you're answering, as others are answering, whatever, just like think on it, send it. Because I, I don't think we need to talk about it, but I want to know what you're reading because I'm nosy. So whatever you would recommend, either recent or uh, in the past that you think everybody should read. It doesn't have to be Arab, it doesn't have to be anything. Um, but yeah, drop that in the chat for us. Um, uh, George, you already gave us one, but feel free to give us another one. Um, so I think we can get we can get a little bit more, you know, it's the last question. I think we can be a little bit more, you know, uh, audacious. Um, so I am curious about, because we talked about the role of pleasure and Sarah had a very like, you know, cute little comment. So, oh my God, Arab's writing about pleasure. But I want to I want to know about the role, if any, that either religion or family plays in your work. Have you had to discard certain identities to kind of approach your page as yourself? What burdens you about like being, quote unquote, in the culture? Um, if anything, I mean, like George is or not George, sorry, has him. You're completely out of the framework now. You're like beyond <laughs> beyond what we're even considering. But if you are still in the framework, family and religion, these like very heavy things, are they are they in your brain at all? Do they hinder you? I mean, what is the um, yeah, what is what is that uh, experience like? I had a question about like culture guiding your work, which you could maybe also attest to. But uh, but yeah, that's that's the question. Yeah. And shout out also in the <laughs> in the group. Yeah. It's loaded, I know. Maybe it's not the best framed qu question, Mary should have edited this one. <laughs> Don't ask about family or religion. Thank you. I just like to retain people's original voices. Yeah. I don't mess with that too much. Um, I could start. Okay. Um, I... <laughs> it's it's taken me many many years to to unpack this and to um and and to sort of be able to express it in this way um but i eventually i eventually realized and, and and this is my personal experience i never like project this onto anyone else but um for many years i did have very strained relationship on both those fronts in terms of um, my identity, in terms of my writing, in terms of sort of how I situate myself and how I think of myself. Um, and then I eventually, I eventually realized that the real strain wasn't actually coming from either of those things, like either my actual relationship with faith, my actual relationship with my family. Um, it was coming from my encounter with this bizarre country in which we find ourselves in it was coming from um this this massive distortion from people around me um from very particular ideas about uh, uh culture uh about uh, uh you know the, the the place i'm from um and this this really uh, uh, insidious and and uh, devious racism and uh, and Islamophobia that um, like for years I just really did not realize had like seeped into me and had had, uh, had like taken control of me <laughs> like, um, like you know I think about it in 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 terms of how. Like for years, like I would tell, I would make the mistake of telling Americans about like, you know, like a fight I would have with my dad and the response would be like, oh my God, he's abusive. And I wouldn't think anything of it. I would just be like, 
oh my God, is my dad abusive? Is that what's happening? Um, and it took me years to be re- to realize you're you're fucking racist. <laughs> like like if this is the first thing that comes to your mind that you like you just you can't imagine um like a, a family dynamic with complexity. Um, you can't imagine a family dynamic with uh, uh, layers that you're not aware of. You also like you can't imagine me being a little shit. Like you have to imagine uh, this this uh, you know Egyptian man far away as as like like immediately as abusive. Like that's that's bizarre. <laughs> and and it took me many years to to sort of to unpack. There were like like similarly with religion. Like there were um, and again this is my own personal experience. Like there were years where I felt this like. Like, like this really like tense relationship with 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 faith and um like ah oh, like Islam and 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 my my oh my my guilt and and whatever and I ultimately realized like my real relate like my my personal as has my real relationship with faith is is boredom it's just that I I'm very bored <laughs> the very like with the particular uh very ju- juridical jurid jurid can't say that word right now. Um, like the 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 very uh, uh conservative uh very uh, almost protestantized version of Sunni Islam that I grew up with um the the actual word that describes my relationship with it is boring like I'm just I very uninterested in it um but that's not a sexiest story for Americans and so it has to be like ah I have I've been like I've been oppressed by faith and it's done all this whatever to me when it's like yeah, like you like growing up um in in Haru, like I, I had some not terribly fun experiences um that that were related to faith or like articulated on the basis of faith, but um but yeah, those experiences were actually distorted by the sort of this very racist insistence that just because you know you have anything to do with Islam or that you have uh, an Arab family, then like there is this 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 deep like there's this horror sense <laughs> thing somewhere that you know there's something larger than life there's something there that's like universal that uh you know a catholic is not going to experience or um uh, or that which, like which uh, they will by the way like the- which <laughs> you know they will you know they will um or uh or you know a uh, a nice white family in the midwest is not going to have those um uh, those complications with their family um and yeah so i've uh so that's sort of been another change for me over the last like couple of years or so of like trying to more soberly look at um uh, uh these kinds of relationships and how they've affected me and to to uh cuz also i do want to bring them in, into my work i do want to uh, think about characters that I write, scenes that I write, um, but also even on the level of of academia, like how that is, is that influences my like uh, uh, critical perception, my understanding of um, of the various topics that I'm dealing with, but uh, but in a sober way, like without this uh, uh, this 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 racialized angle, um, yeah like removing your own prejudice before even reckoning with it yeah yeah anyone else i mean i I think i share similar um overlaps i realize that a lot of like questions of quote-unquote faith in my work even very i mean obviously very different religious experience um as has them but as a christian palestinian uh born and raised in the u.s south (laughs) <laughs> um and that convergence um they weren't really creations of faith they're really questions of coloniality they're questions of evangelicalism <laughs> they were questions um they were questions of yeah um i did an interview recently um with another queer palestinian person and uh, asking about you know let's talk about you know homophobia within our community context and um this person is doing great. Like they're doing like interviews with a bunch of just different queer Palestinians um, in their community and whatnot. And um, thinking about like for me, and again, this is very not universalized and I don't want to speak again <laughs> as a representative of like, I, I hate representative discourse and whatnot. And um, 
this is absolutely not totalizing, but my experience growing up in the U.S. South was actually the home, the least homophobic people around me were the Palestinians, um, pretty fucking consistently. Um, and um, furthermore, when they were homophobic, it mimicked the homophobia of the like Southern evangelical white supremacist kind of uh, background. Um, and they were absorbing it actually from that background. And then the second you would push them on anything, it would just crumble. They're just like, wait, no, this isn't actually that big of a deal. <laughs> like, um, and so, um, yeah, I don't know. It was just interesting. And the the you know the big bad oh, like for a while, I was so scared about you know um, coming out and stuff and like being so guarded about my sexuality. But honestly, one quick Google search, you'll be like, George Abraham is a capital F faggot. You know, it's like it's very, it's like so screamingly obvious. And like, thank God. Most of the elders in our family don't even know what the Google is. So um, then I've just kind of been like vibing off of that. But yeah, I mean, it's been really, um, I'm not even scared anymore if they find out or whatever. They're going to be like, oh, cool. So we know this, you know, and George hasn't initiated that conversation with us and that's fine. And that's like on their terms and whatnot. Um, and again, I think I'm very lucky <laughs> to have that kind of a, family background that's def absolutely a privilege um and um but yeah just to throw another thing in there just complicating um like the narrative tm whatever the <laughs> yeah yeah uh same re google shit search i'm like dying on, um which is fine yeah uh zane yeah um uh, in terms of my family, in terms of religion, I'm uh, uh, I come from a Shia family from South Lebanon, but I'm an agnostic who became an agnostic uh, during the Lebanese Civil War when I saw people killing each other based on religion, and uh, so I I um, but they know they my family knows that, uh, uh, but I I was raised by women. My grandmother, two aunts, um, uh, one uh, of which uh, Lin was very familiar with by now, <laughs> and and they were very uh, accepting and very loving. In fact, I feel like I'm so charged with love for the rest of my life. I have uh, spare <laughs> spare love to give because it was just um, such a loving thing and. They they criticize you know they criticize my ideas and everything but that didn't really stop them from you know caring and uh, loving me and and also yeah and also even the you know because my family uh, 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 claims uh, ancestry back to the prophet uh, the, each generation had to basically supply a cleric <laughs> from my family who uh and but but the cleric uh in my family that lived in a like a, a this a three part house uh was really cool about everything uh so i never was you know felt harassed uh, unfortunately they're all gone all these women and all this and that that in you know that it, it's kind of a lot of uh uh, my early writing was trying to get them back, basically, um, and uh, uh, and there's so much in uh, in that region, in that in that vi little village where I grew up, that is so rich with stories and and things that are no longer no longer exist, traditions uh, that no longer exist. It's it's almost like they're from a. I always say it's like from a different century, which makes it excellent for, uh, you know, uh, 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 for tapping, it makes it for fertile ground for creativity. Uh, so that's that's my two cents on that. I loved uh, Charged with Love. And that's how we know that even though that they're gone, they're, they're still in you, you know? Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, either Andrea or Sara, whoever. <laughs> uh, I'll just speak briefly this is a, a complicated question for me I have divorced parents and all of that and so um, I have much more relationship I don't have a relationship with my dad who is from Lebanon and so my like reclamation into 
like Swana de Aspros really came as a young adult and finding like spaces with like community spaces and writer spaces with other Swana writers. And so, um, you know, thank you to all of you on the panel and for creating spaces like this that, you know, continue to bring us all together despite floods and pandemics and all that. Okay, I'll go. Um, I won't say too much right now because these are still active questions for me, but I will say that I'm trying to balance um, pride in like all aspects of my identity with like a desire to like deeply care for and love and honor um, the ancestors and my living family and all they represent and believe. Um, I did resonate a lot with what Hazem said about just like the imposed narratives of like your father's abusive or whatever, like growing up, I was so congratulated for being allowed to go to school by like white evangelical folks that were around me. They're like, it's so nice of you. Your father lets you go to school, you and your sisters, you know, like all of that. So lucky me, I got to go to school. Um, it was actually my father who said like, don't even yeah, you're getting at least a bachelor's degree. Like, don't even think about it. Preferably graduate studies as well. So, um, yeah, so did that. Um, I guess I'm thinking a lot about like my grandmother as well, who wrestled a lot. Like I've just like through my like book, which is an experimental memoir, I've been really delving into um, her story and like the complexity of her suffering that had a lot to do with patriarchy. Um, and I guess when it comes to the decisions on what to write on and what to share, I try and only write towards experiences of others that I feel like I can truly render with at least a few dimensions. So like male ancestors and relatives and even like living male relatives who or female relatives who represent patriarchy in some way. Um, if I can't bring them in their like humanity, I like, that's just not for sharing. So I think it's an open question. I share like with a lot of like other Arab writers, um, and Muslim writers and other marginalized writers of like which conversations and which stories to share where and with whom. Um, so I'm, I try to be really judicious about that. And I also try and think about, um, my grandmother and the differences in, in like the freedoms and privileges I have, and that it is also honoring her to be more proudly, um, visible in my identities and my life. Um, when people tell me that, like, they're so surprised I'm Arab or they're so surprised I'm Muslim, like, you know, I'm told, like, oh, I would never have guessed, you know, you don't see Muslim, you don't see Arab. I'm like, yes, I do. You just don't know who we are. So just being as much of myself in every place I, I go and everything I write and allowing the identity markers whether it's Palestinian or Muslim or something else um, to like live and, and like create tension, hopefully for people who like, whose framework is too small. It was like a perfect answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys all um, for generously answering, for giving me a lot to think about um, on this rainy evening. I'm going to have another glass of wine on my own <laughs> secretly and ponder being charged with love and, existing in my identities and um Mehra, I think I think we're good now we should take uh Q&A so um I saw there was one question for Hazem from uh, Nawaz um if he wants to address and then if anybody else has any questions just drop them in the chat we'll kind of like popcorn them until uh yeah <laughs> yeah um thank you all so much uh really also thinking about that closing parting note from Sarah creating tension for folks whose framework is too small and it made me think of confrontation and how we consistently confront when we write and who do we confront and what existing narratives do we confront and there is great joy in that kind of confrontation even if it does not lead to something immediate and large and and constructive um the rebellion itself there's something beautiful and constructive about it and thank you all for sharing your responses i want to direct your attention and i know hala also is here and has a hand raised and hala i will come to you in exactly a minute but this is a question from nawaz for hazem um and um uh, nawaz did say that they are unable to speak in person on video um but uh this is a question for us to chew on uh and i'm going to read the question out loud for the room 
again, it is directed to Hazem, but also to the entire panel, Kinwa included. Um, Nawaz asked, you talked about Europe being, in a sense, a part of Asia, considering, among other things, that they are the same landmass. I kind of saw it conflicting with my view, though I don't disagree with what you said, in that even within the smaller regions, so that, such as South Asia or West Asia, there are major deadly fault lines that are killing people as we speak. India, just to name a country, continues to fall into a fascist vortex. Um, could you share how you see this contradiction? Territorially, thinking of political resolution as a goal, if at all, of course, do you, but not you in specific, but rather the larger you, look within territories and regions or without? Uh, I feel like it's a very complex question, Hazem, and I invite you to respond yeah. to that. Um, and so if, if I'm understanding the question correctly um i it, it seems there uh, there has been a misunderstanding of my point which is not that europe should be considered part of asia or that fault line should be erased um but rather what i was uh speaking to was that there is often this very uh what is in my opinion a very shallow critique of certain categories um where it's like, oh, we shouldn't use this term, we shouldn't use uh, a name for this for this region because it's constructed. And and so my point is, literally everything is, everything is. So the only question is, in what way are you using it? So for example, a term like uh, Arab that uh, we brought up earlier, and so we brought up how there's uh, currently tension on um, uh, a term, a term like that uh, also depends in what sense you're using it. Are you using it um, to mean this bizarre American racialization of extremely, an extremely vast and diverse geography of different uh, peoples of very different skin tones of very different dialects? Um, or are you meaning it in a uh, anti-colonial political lens of trying to think through how people in this region who are uh, 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 affected by very similar issues of imperialism, um, who have very historic uh, roots and connections, uh, can possibly work together. Um, obviously not exclusively, like together amongst other uh, intersecting solidarities towards something. Um, that the, the latter is a sense I'm invested in, the former I don't care about. And, and uh, uh, well, actually I do, I do care about, I care about refuting it because I'm not interested in Arab as a race. Uh, Arab is not a race, it's never actually been. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's what I meant. That's, that's, that's all I meant by Europe is that not that it should be, but that, um, it's, it's, it just, it highlights that everything is constructed. And so we, the, the more important thing we need to think about is, um, what is the purpose of any term that we're using geographical, cultural, linguistic, whatever. I think just to add to that, and I want to add other, I want to invite other people to share, but um, also, I guess, a parallel um, analogy would be the identity marker for South Asia, uh, which, uh, you know, um, subsumes all of these neighboring nations um, that share borders with India. Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, Sri Lanka, not directly a border, but across um, a small water body, or Nepal, um, um, and more, um, you know, into this kind of common identity, erasing um, the political influence of India, particularly its influence in erasing its Muslim citizens and um, their faith and their practice and um, their right to live um, safely in the country of their birth. And so um, I think that would be the parallel analogy to what you're making, that ultimately we should be respectful of nuances um, and also collectivist identities as a tool for anti-colonial, anti-imperial struggles, right? I want to invite other people in the group to what they feel about that intersectional solidarity between Arab countries and Arab nations, which, you know, religion, across religion, across race, across dialects, across languages, um, across practices. I'll just hop in and say something quickly that's, I think, adjacent. Um, it's conversations like this where I really love being Palestinian because I think what Palestine can represent is something that's like beyond this like failed idea of a nation state, which I think 
like all around the world, we're seeing what a poor idea that was that this epoch is waning and bringing a lot of violence with it. And as a Palestinian, when I think about liberation, I I dream of being able to expand beyond like a specific like land territory and like open up conversations of like other ways of being and other ways of of organizing and um, not in the idealistic sense that I don't think the land is important at all, but just like our imaginations don't need to be so backwards looking. I understand like there's a sense with many Palestinians that we didn't get our chance. Like everybody else got a shot at the nation state. Like we went straight from empires and nation state, you know, we, we got skipped, but I think that's also really exciting. I think it's beautiful. We didn't have, you know, I mean, obviously occupation, apartheid, awful, but I think we're in a really radical, like position to think radically. And I, and I like really want to push our communities towards that. Um, if nobody wants to add anything else, I uh, would like to pass the mic over to Hala, who is here, um, who also has a question for the room. Hi. First of all, this has been so lovely. What a wonderful way to spend a Friday night. It's Friday. Yes, it, I had a moment of panic where I was like, am I getting the fucking dare? Um, my, I have two questions. Feel free to answer one, both or neither. One, I want to know what people are working on right now. And that includes also maybe just what, if there's an idea that you keep coming back to or something you're you're feeling obsessed with, there's something that you're just starting to flirt with and daydream about. Like, is, is there a seed of something that people are are playing with? And then the other one is I'm interested in practices of care. I'm I'm interested in like, how do you care for yourselves? How do you replenish yourselves both intrapsychically, like within the individual, but also within and through community? And I'm curious what that looks like for folks. I think that these two answers are very related because I'm working on a memoir right now. And um, it's something that I noticed consistently brought up across events in Palestine rights, actually, from your beautiful panel, Hala, with um, Isabel Hamad and Suhair Hamad, uh, Isabel Hamad and um, um, uh, Sahar Mustafa, et cetera, et cetera, um, and other panels, too, talking about, like, folks being like, oh, memoirs are so fucking hard. And like, um, and there was a lot of really productive discussion about like fiction as like um, a way of just like preserving one's care and sanity and um, and telling like great stories um, with while protecting oneself. Um, and I think that like, I actually, um, I don't know. I just had a very different experience with memoir. I feel like I was, the story I was trying to tell, I was trying to fictionalize it so much and I was running from the harder story um, personally. But then again, the poet impulse to like, no, let's go harder into the like thing we're running from kind of <laughs> things sort of took over. Um, but yeah, it just had to, it's led me to, it's forced me to A, trust my, non-linearities in my writing process um it's forced me also to just like have conversations with people and not think about again oh is this productive towards the memoir or whatever it like because I think memoir is really the genre that like if I don't do the kind of more fundamental work of care for myself or care for the topics I'm writing about within my family and whatnot um the memoir is gonna fall apart <laughs> um and um, and with other genres, you know, with poetry, it's like, oh, no, just put it away for a bit and come back. Or um, with fiction, you know, there's always structural ways, <laughs> you know, to, to, to kind of get around some of these things. But um, yeah, with the memoir, it's like, no, I need to do the human work first. I need to, you know, be safe. I need to be uh, present uh, for my bodily needs before anything else. And I think it's actually been really... Um, yeah, it's forced me to care for myself in ways other writing has never actually done. Um, and um, 
I feel like there was something else I had. Oh yeah, I know there's a like I, I mean, Sana and I are writing letters to each other right now. I wrote the most mentally ill letter to her about black holes like the other week because um, my memoir is essentially a trip into a black hole. So I've just been like obsessing over like <laughs> black holes. If anyone wants to talk like astrophysics like later, let me know. But um, yeah, and these weird like inversion um because black holes like house their singularities rips in space-time at the very center of them um, called the singularity that like um, the black hole is like the more I like study and think about these kind of with both physics background and pop science kind of things the more I see black holes are kind of unlikely protectors of the universe in a way um, these big bodies of like lightlessness that are like no get away from me go away you will not escape me <laughs> like because honestly if there was a singularity in space time that was unhoused everything we know about reality would crumble and and like if we actually made contact with that like that would be the most terrifying thing in the universe the black holes are saying no I'm trying to protect you actually I'm trying I'm trying to tell you to get away I'm trying to tell you this is the kinder way that I'm gonna spaghettify you like literally shred you um, into hot plasma instead of you having contact with the singularity because that's the better kinder death um, and furthermore when black holes slowly die and like slowly like leak out their radiation they get smaller 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 and boom the singularity is healed at the center there's no more singularity black holes are in like they are actually kind of suturers um and so i wonder about that as a metaphor for the kind of care palestinians and other you know victims of colonial violence have for you know do for each other sometimes we're so like we're so worried about oh my gosh like what is the perception or like we're such illegible quote unquote bodies we're such um we're bodies that have extreme like capability to harm each other um because of our traumas but like how do we become unlikely protectors in that as well um it's kind of the gist of that um so yeah anyway that was a very very long-winded <laughs> answer of, um yeah um my uh, answer to those questions is also uh, uh related because um I uh, have been, I had been working, I started like in 2018, I started what I imagined at the time would be a full length um, uh, project uh, of, of poems. And it was uh, tentatively titled Frontier Redux, um, which is still the title that I'm using, but it, it, it might change, but it's basically been um, this idea for, uh, it's it started off with like, I forced myself like for a while to not write poems that had any like my hashtag country vibe like I long for the food of the, like any, any of those tropes I just like wanted to see what happened if I forced myself not to write it um and the poems ended up being uh about the uh about about this country um and not about like being the Arab in this country but just like being in this country at all and and the the, the 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 haunted landscape of like being anywhere in not just a settler colony but but the original the 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 blueprint for um for settler colonialism and 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 sort of looking for traces in that and that around me and then I I re uh I picked up the project again this year when I started writing um what my partner very affectionately called economy poems it's just like I started writing poems about my rent like about like groceries <laughs> and then they started to make sense together um uh but 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 the reason i say it's related to the second one is that um the thing that uh, like like in terms of the community and relationship with other people like there are definitely sort of there are definitely sweeter examples i can give and they are and they are very important but you 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 gotta have friends with whom you can be a hater. Like you gotta have that friend you can hit up, and and be like, "Am I crazy or this? <laughs> or like, was this thing messed up? <laughs> or should this thing not have happened?" Um, and and, and so I'm I'm very grateful to have uh, uh George as a bestie who I commonly vent to, and very com and very uh, uh very commonly like holds my venting and makes me feel like I'm not crazy um 
because those are also the friends you tell about your projects and you tell about the ideas that you're having and, and, and who push you forward. Um, and obviously, again, like it's 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 crucial in 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 these kinds of relationships to have that very supportive, positive side of like, yes, you can do this. And yes, keep working on this. And it's, it's a great idea. And I want to see more. But you also need like comrades in hating. You also need people to <laughs> to whom you can vent who's venting you can hold um, because there are a lot of, there are a lot of reasons to be angry and you need uh, good friends who will hold and share that, that anger with you and make you feel like you're not insane for having it. Um, I just wanted to tell George that um, I have to send you this poem that I wrote about black holes and it's a, it's the black hole as a catharsis it's it's actually a eulogy where uh where going through the black hole is a cathartic experience and and being shot out from the other side as a, a stream of light uh, and so on and so forth but i'll have to send it to you uh, uh having said that i uh uh first of all in terms of caring uh the question about caring for oneself that hala uh, mentioned is that I, uh, I'm shedding stuff, or, you know, that's my way of caring, you know, stuff that for a long time I knew I shouldn't be doing, but I do it out of obligation and I'm shedding it because there's, there's a, I feel there's a lot at stake now that I really, the time is becoming more and more precious. And the other thing is that uh, also I'm making space to just be away from home, from like my home in DC, and and uh, just escaping. So I, I I would also encourage everybody to apply for the Arab American National Museum uh, Artist in Residence. Uh, it uh, I I'll be serving as the Artist in Residence this summer in Detroit at at the museum. They give you uh, amazing. Uh, uh, they first of all they they. Uh, of course, pay for all your costs and give you a stipend and all that. But they also put you up in a in a luxury loft in City Hall. Uh, it's called an artist uh, like luxury. Uh, and all you know, uh, all of you would be like if you need that time. It's it's just such a simple application, and you're you're just perfect for it. Uh, so uh that's that's uh, uh, about caring about what i'm working on uh like sarah i lived in saudi arabia for way too long <laughs> i i uh my fa and i had uh, a special i had this uh i had an experience like a, a very unique experience in a sense my father was this like uh graduates out of fifth grade goes goes into hotel school in Beirut and goes and works for the U.S. military for 35 years as a civilian running a restaurant. So I lived on a military base that wasn't called a military base until the second Gulf War, where they, decide, they decided to admit that there's a military base. So I have this insight about compounds and living in compounds. So the, I'm writing a novel which is the first draft is halfway through right now, but the the which I will hope to finish at the Arab American National Museum. But um, the the novel is really about uh, life in the compounds in Saudi Arabia, and if you can think of the kind of dysfunction that exists under the manicured lawns of our beloved suburbias, take those and 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 put them in a pressure cooker. All that dysfunction of the compound. And you'll 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 get you know there's so much crap going on underneath there, and so the 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 story follows a, a triangle relationship between two American expats. That's what they call themselves, not immigrants. <laughs> expats and and this Arab boy, and uh, uh, and it's about the rise and fall of this relationship, the the, the total destruction. Uh, but it's really uh, ultimately it is about life in uh, in these compounds and what was going on and all the intrigue and all the crap that was going on underneath. Um, 
can go next. Um, I am in deep admiration of all of you who write long form prose because I am been struggling to get through finishing my poets novel, which is not in verse, it's in prose, but it's mostly in run ons because one of the many things I love about poetry is the fact that there are no rules and you can create your own architecture and I haven't yet gotten to that place um, with my prose. And so it's, it's like a, you know, 60,000 word stream of run-ons at this point, but it's about um, sort of figuring myself out as a poet and both um, doing performance. I've done a lot of visceral performance in which I do, which I staple myself or do like piercings on stage. Um, And so it's sort of figuring out my poetic practice, my performance practice, and being transformed through different relationships and being parts of different um, communities that have been like transformative and also you know traumatic so it's all of that and um I'm trying to finish it by the end of this year because I'm applying to med school right now um and so hopefully I will be going off to med school um at the end of next summer so you are Arab I'm just kidding (laughs) Uh, yeah (laughs) (laughs) every every Arab family wants a doctor um that's awesome that's amazing I'm so like George just said I'm so grateful to be around all of you amazing writers and to be your readers um I look forward to all of these forthcoming works um yes I can't wait to read the the compound story um that's a under reported world um Thank you for your question, Hala. Um, it's it's wonderful to have you here. Um, it's your your question of what are you working on and how are you taking care of yourself is like a question I always want to ask you actually because you model care for the community in such amazing ways with your backyard series, um, with the way I'm sure you know you take care of your students, your clients, and you're constantly you're so prolific. So I'm, I'm like in awe of you always. Um, and I wonder about your secret, but um, I'm just grateful you're in the world. Um, Mostly I'm working on my memoir right now because I'm supposedly finishing the first draft um, of the full manuscript, inshallah, in the, like by the end of the year, inshallah. Um, doesn't look good, but inshallah. Um, but I really, I'm dabbling. I've been dabbling all year in poetry. I, I would like to do more poetry, um, but I'm a poetry baby and I'm shy about it. Um, how I'm taking care um, I think I've just learned, uh, I mean, just to echo what a lot of folks have had uh, said, like they have a lot of wisdom. Um, I think George said, do the human work first. I think several people mentioned their bodies, their groceries, like, um, you know, taking care. I'm, I'm like pretty adamant about my sleep, little things like that. Like just trying to like take care of like the body basics where I can, there's so much I can't control. Um, and then um, like community care, um, just being in spaces like this, again, I'm incredibly grateful um, and just you know, sustained by folks like all of these panelists through their work and through their like real life relationships. And um, I'm trying to slowly in the midst of the overwhelm, like tiptoe towards like um, more um, integration and like care towards like my community as I think um, has mentioned, you know, just being in this country, not as an auto, but just like being in this country, this haunted land. Um, I'm trying, haunting is everything to me. <laughs> Um, I started my book because I felt haunted. I'm trying to be as haunted as I can. And I'm trying to haunt um, in many ways. Um, that's a whole nother discussion, but um, this is a haunted land. So I'm trying to dig into more like, what is my role? Um, Viet Tan Nguyen said, said once, like, when does the refugee become a settler? And I feel that deeply as like the child of refugees who's in a settler colonial nation. So I've been trying to study um, indigenous activists and scholars more and um, abolitionism as well and trying to like cobble together like a learning group on zoom um, to the best of my ability so trying to like think about like how I ought to be like caring in this haunted land that I'm like partaking in so, yeah. sounds fantastic thank you all for sharing um I want to invite one other question if somebody has any just to make sure uh, that we've covered uh, feel free to raise your hand and or drop a quick hello in the chat 
Yeah, um, I agree, George. I feel like that was the best ending to just talking about influences and what you folks are working on. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I'm going to first thank all of our panelists um, and our incredible moderator uh, for sharing your wisdom, uh, for sharing the work that moves you, um, and um, also giving us an insight into the amount of passion and intention that goes into writing what you do. Um, and there's so much background to all of this um, and we're just scratching the surface. And so the best way for us to learn what these incredible writers um, intentioned with their work is to read them, right? If you go through the chat, I have shared links to all of their works. Um, the best thing to do would be to purchase copies of their books and or request your local public library to have copies of their books that you can then issue and borrow and read and then talk about. Um, it's to write about these books, uh, whatever that platform is, maybe Goodreads, as broken as the system of Goodreads is. Um, I guess it's up to us to sort of keep it in check. So whether that's Goodreads, whether that's Amazon reviews, whether that's your own, you know, social media pages, it's to write about about these works to talk to be in conversation with the works that you read um so please check their works out a lot of the publishers who publish the authors on the panel will be at brooklyn book festival so maybe you can also go to those respective booths and touch those books and feel them uh, before you've had a chance um, to grab a copy for yourselves um, and of course we are radix media we are going to be at booth 603 so please come and say hi we want to thank you all for joining us today on this rainy day in New York. I hope you guys continue to remain safe and dry um, and show up for the people who need your help um, on a day like this. Um, thank you all. Please cuddle up, uh, you know, play a movie, get a drink and enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you all so much. Thank you all wonderful people. Thank you to the panel. Uh, we will be recording this conversation and sharing it on YouTube. I wish you all a wonderful night. Um, and uh, I wanna ask the panelists to stay back for a quick second, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>